But before we begin, I want to take a few seconds um, for a quick exercise. And I know you're like, I did not come here for exercise tonight, Chris, and I came here for a panel discussion on mental health. Um, and I know we all just left some type of work, right? Whether we're headed to job number two in the house or job number two outside the house. Um, we have probably had a lot on our shoulders today. And as leaders, we are always under uh, some type of specific demand. And for some of us, we just need to breathe. Um, like I, even me getting on tonight, it was like, okay, I gotta make sure this is in place, this is in place, make sure the daughter gets where she needs to go. And I just need to take a second and like breathe. I know you rushed in so you can hurry up and get on tonight's uh, episode of Women Leaders Walk the Talk. And so I want to take like five seconds. Can I be corny for a second? The social worker in me wants <laughs> us to take like five seconds and just breathe. I want to count on, to the count of three and we're going to uh, just breathe. So one, two, three, breathe. The social worker wants us to take like five seconds. Okay, so I hope that was five seconds, but I needed that. I don't know about you, I probably really did that for me because I needed that moment to breathe, but I wanted to give us an opportunity considering what tonight's topic is to really make sure that we are centered and that we are focused. And so now we can get started. And with that, welcome to the Women Leaders Walk the Talk session uh, sponsored by my company, the Greater You Leadership Series. And I am your leadership enthusiast. Kristen Webb. I love all things leadership and I love the Women Leaders Walk the Talk. This is something I look forward to every single month because it gives me an opportunity to be biased about leadership um, and allows me to be able to amplify the voice of female leaders. And it is so critical and so important that, that there is inclusivity all the time. Um, and so this platform allows for that. It allows for us to hear from expert female leaders in their respective spaces. Um, so I'm happy to be here. We were away for the summer because we had some youth programming we were doing, but back to our fall programming, starting out with Women Leaders Walk the Talk. And it seemed only right that we do um, the breathing exercise I just had for a moment and center our thoughts. A few housekeeping tips before I get started. We want to hear from you tonight. This is a panel discussion, but we want to engage with our audience. We want to hear from you. We want to, um, you know, engage with you with the chat. So please leave your comments, like, and of course, share. So if you haven't liked the Grady Leadership Series, I'm looking at you a little side eyes. Go ahead and make that happen tonight. Uh, and then, of course, share tonight's uh, episode while you are watching with us, share with all your friends. So tonight's focus, as I mentioned, is a special one. And it's for a few reasons, right? I'm always preaching confidence. Like if you take any course from me, the, uh, the foundation to me to being a great leader is kind of understanding yourself and truly having confidence, self-confidence and knowing how to manage that. But I really understand that self-confidence is driven by our mental health. Um, the balance of it or the imbalance of it, how we feel about ourselves is driven by our mental health. Um, so that's reason number one. Reason number two is because I'm a female leader. And in my most recent capacity, I am having to learn to be more cognitive of my mental health. It is so critical because there are too many distractions in our workspaces a lot of times that um, really can jolt us if we're not secure, if we're not stable uh, mentally, if we're just not in a healthy space. Um, and so for me as a leader, a female leader, it is intentional and imperative that I'm always on top of it, right? Um, third reason, I've experienced family and friends. Um, who struggle with mental health, who suffer with mental health, um, whether it's in a mild or an extreme case. Um, and I just see the importance of the awareness and uh, bringing light to it. And then lastly, I don't know if y'all noticed, but the world is going crazy right now. Um, it is super chaotic. And I attribute that chaoticness to mental health, uh, people's mental capacity. What's going on up here? determines what kind of decisions we're making, how it impacts others. And then that cycle continues, you know, and it doesn't matter what industry, what space you're in, it always matters. And so because of these reasons and probably a host, a host of reasons that you all just came up with on your own, I wanted to focus on mental health. Um, I wanted to hear though from some female professionals that are doing the work, okay? This is Women Leaders Walk the Talk. We're not over here just yapping. Yes, we're having a panel discussion, but when these ladies get off, some of them going back to school tonight. Some of them are probably gonna follow up with some clients. You know, others are preparing for the next day because they truly are walking 
the talk. And that's what's so important to me when I bring panelists on. And they are truly pure in their intentions of helping others be the best versions of themselves. We had a little pre-conversation beforehand and like the conversation just resonated again that these people care, these women care what they do. Um, and so they're leaders in their respective space, why they're here, why they're qualified, why they're sitting on this panel tonight. And so they are the experts and we need to hear your voices. And so with that, I introduce to you uh, and maybe reintroduce to others, Dr. Audrey Townsend with owner of Calix Psychological Services. Did I get it right? That's right. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm one for three, one for three. All right, I also have with me tonight, Diavola Ford, owner of Ask Diavola Shade LLC. And last but not least, I have Courtney L. Porter with Courtney L. Porter and Associates. Hello, ladies. Hey. Hey. I am so glad you all uh, took the time out of your busy schedules to uh, just sit down and talk with me. I say talk with my friends, talk with the audience, because we're all friends out here. You know, whether you believe it or not, we friends, we best friends, we go back. Um, that's what I'm telling. That's the story I'm telling from now. OK, hey. <laughs> uh, so we're going to start with the very first question. If you have seen this audience before or even for my panelists, the very first question I always like to ask is in my segment called the three second rule. So the five second rule, just as a reminder, uh, for those of us who want to act like we don't know, the five second rule is if you drop food on the ground, you know, you got five seconds to pick it up for anybody to look at your side that like, ooh, she might be a little nasty. We're going to play the three second rule. And the three second rule is me doing a three second countdown for you to give me the first word or phrase that comes to your mind that represents leadership. And on the count of three, I don't, don't get, just shout it out. One, two, three. Resilience. Mm. Listening. Mm. Grace. Gra Ooh. Grace. So we got resilience, listening, and grace. Ooh, I am uh, looking forward to exploring those three tonight. And the reason I always ask that question, um, usually what first comes to us is the most authentic and genuine thought. And it's what we will probably hear as a common thread as each of us talk tonight. And so I always like to use it as like our, our baseline, like keep falling back on that. And so with that, tell me why you chose resilience or listening or grace. Um, I can say that I, choose, I chose resilience because I think as a leader, um, you have to be okay with failing, but also getting back up. I think a lot of people think when they see people in leadership or seeing people win that they don't fail, they get it right on the first try. And I'm like, the people who are the most successful have failed the most times. So it's all about that resiliency. And that's one of my favorite words. So I really, I'm a little biased on that one. I love it. <laughs> and I completely agree with you completely. So what about my listening and my grace? Uh, well, I chose listening because a lot of times leaders some leaders think that they're supposed to go in a situation knowing everything and knowing it all and just dictating what people need to do when actual leaders know how to listen to the people they serve so they'll know how to better serve them. Mm -hmm. I love that. And then you spoke on like one of my main, I, I have four cores for the great leadership series and serving leadership is that. Um, and I, I agree, listening gets you to that point. Um, and it's a selflessness in wanting to listen and being open and not just hearing and not pretending, but actually digesting it and processing it so that you can be effective. So, right. All right, Grace, what we got on Dr. R. <laughs> so as women leaders, I think that we are always the hardest on ourselves. Um, we think we have to be there early, stay late. Everything has to be perfect. Um, but I think that we don't allow ourselves to be human sometimes. And sometimes we don't, we don't get everything right. But in those moments is when we have to give ourselves grace and to allow ourselves to be human because that, that's what makes the best leaders is knowing your limitations, honoring yourself and giving yourself grace in the process. Mm. That's, a, that's a tough one. I think you saw my post earlier this week. I said, honoring you. Um, or honor you like it was it's important that we do do that and grace is what I think helps us get there like really being okay with not being okay or not being perfect and things not always mapping out um, the way they should so thank you all for that so 
I want to just like get a good definition. Like I know what I think mental health means. I know some of my audience members, they may think they know what mental health means, but just from the experts, um, what, what is your definition of mental health? Uh, and then anything you may want to add to that. You got to pull numbers, Chris. You got to tell us who's going first. <laughs> The person I saw make the first reaction. Let's go with Courtney. (laughs) Come on, Courtney. What you got? Okay. Um, To me, mental health is housekeeping of your mind, body, and spirit. Um, When you take a personal inventory of yourself emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, and you're able to assess, adapt, and make the necessary changes to grow and evolve. Hmm. I like that. You you got me stuck at housekeeping. Um, and and the reason I like that terminology because it's like it's cleaning up, it's keeping mm-hmm. things tidy, it's keeping things organized. Um, and to housekeep, you have to do it regularly. Like you know, you got to get to the baseboards. Sometimes I hate the baseboards. I hate the toilet. I know. Take the most work. <laughs> the most work but that's what housekeeping is and that's what mental health is like keeping it in perspective it's the work that goes into it so love that love that what about you Audrey um for me just piggybacking on what Courtney said all of the above but um for me is mental health is really just how you show up Mm -hmm. um, for yourself for other people and what things you bring in that space you know we all come with our own history we all come with our past relationships so how do you bring that and how do you show up in your current space? And that is, you know, how do you socially, career-wise, spiritually, physically, um, all that is tied to your mental health. Hmm. I love it. I love it. How you show up. You know, I want to think about clothes, but it's not that. It's the emotional <laughs> show up. It's the mental show up, uh, which is so much more important than this nice red colored jumpsuit I had on tonight. I think somebody may appreciate that, Diablo, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, you are absolutely right. It is the way you show up. So I love that. What about you, Ms. Ford? What, what is your definition of mental health? I think um, everyone else just had great definitions. So I guess the sum it all up is just like taking inventory of where you are and what space you are and being present. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times um, we kind of feel off course and that is that that little light bulb that lets you know I need to check in with myself. So just taking the time to like what uh, Ms. Porter said, assess where you are and being able to address anything that is in lack of better terms out of whack. Right, right. right. I, love, I love it. Being present, that's, that's what stuck out to me because we can just be in spaces and exist. A lot of times we find ourselves existing because it's intentional, like life is intentional, you know, um, but we can easily shift into autopilot mode um, and really not be in control. So showing up present, uh, alert, aware. Um, Yeah, I love it, I love it. Thank you all for that. So with that, because I do know that there are aspiring mental health experts out there, right? There are some social workers, some psychologists, some therapists out here in the audience tonight, and maybe they just need a word from you all on how and what drew you to mental health. Um, And maybe those will be some things that kind of resonate with them as they walk that journey of maybe trying to be a leader in that space. Yeah, what got you there? Let's go with you first, Diablo. Uh, What brought me to the field, because I was supposed to be a pharmacist. So, you know, the Lord, he has a sense of humor. But I actually got married at a young age and got divorced early. And I just felt kind of just really like lost So I actually ended up going to career counseling because I was like, I really don't want to do pharmacy, just feeling lost. Long story short, the way the counselor just really dug into like, you know, what are your passions? You know, how was it growing up for you? What even made you choose pharmacy in the first place? The way she counseled me, I was like, oh, I want to do that for other people, but more so like for women, like they maybe go through this, they have gone through the same situations that I have being able to learn who you are because a lot of times in relationships if you don't know who you are that relationship will tell you who you are and I wanted to be able to show people that you know really you were born enough and everything else is just the added cherry on top a lot of times we think we need relationships to be considered enough and that's what I thought at some point so that was my driving force to be able to help women that went through the same situation that I did all right, get your love house in order. Did y'all hear that? Sign mm-hmm. up for me. Love house in order. 
house in order. But I even heard beyond love. I heard relationships just in general across the board because we can get lost in those relationships uh, otherwise, you know, be it work, be it significant others, whatever it is. So I love that. And thank you for joining the mental health field. I, we need more people like you for sure. How about you, Dr. Audrey? I wish I had this very um, eloquent, like heartfelt reason. <laughs> we want real, we want transparent, we want what it is. So I went to Xavier um, in New Orleans because I was bio pre-med. I was going to be a neurosurgeon. Oh, wow. Um, and so um, my dad helped me get an internship with the neurosurgeon um, the summer of my freshman year. And I went in, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. Gone ho about it, went into the operating room, you know, just as a spectator. And the first incision, I passed out. So I don't remember anything else. Woke up and was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this is going to work for me. So went back to Xavier and that's when we were taking all of our core classes and psychology was one of those classes. Um, and when I tell you, that's when I really learned that I'm a conceptual learner, um, mm -hmm. that I, I, I learn in stories. I, I draw pictures with my mind when people are telling me things like, and some of my clients will tell you, it looks like I'm looking off, but they know that like, I'm drawing pictures in my brain because I'm about to say something. Um, to kind of pull it all together. And so that's when I realized that this is where I felt comfortable. Like all of those years of school and I just felt like I was in, just doing a routine like I, because I had to get good grades. But this is when I, when I got into psychology and started taking more psychology classes, that's when I realized this is really what I was supposed to be doing because it was easy for me. It was something that I didn't enjoy doing. It was something that I love reading about. Um, so just, being immersed in the field is really what sparked the fire for me. And that's kind of how I ended up where I am now. Love it. And it's okay. I mean, we, we've heard two tracks that started, it sounds like in medicine, <laughs> and, you know, and ended up, you know, on the other side of the tracks in mental health. And I promise my story is very the same. So I get it. I get it. But sometimes we do have to start off on that one track so we can stumble upon what's really the purpose. So I love it. Love it. What about you, Courtney? Um, the kind of along everybody else's line. I didn't plan on going in mental health when I started. It kind of, you know how people say, I didn't choose Memphis, Memphis chose me. It's like, I didn't choose mental health, mental health chose me. The career that I started in was um, working at a day treatment facility, um, just doing groups and counseling clients. And I was just, I don't know, it's, for, some, for some reason it shaped the direction that I wanted to go into because in school it just mental health didn't interest me I thought I would want to go into medical social work or work for the state or just something along those lines I didn't think mental health was my area but I realized that I really enjoy working with people and getting to know people and their stories and based off the reaction that I got from working with people I was like oh I think I may be pretty good at this so maybe, you know, I should continue to hone in on my skills with it. And I ended up enjoying it along the way. But going into it, I was just like, I don't know if this is what I want to do, but I really enjoy it like right now. And that was going to be my follow-up question. Who's all glad that they stumbled upon it? Yeah. I see some hands. I see all the hands. I love it. I love it. So thank you all for sharing that. For those who are interested in the industry, you don't have to stumble upon it, right? Um, there are so many times that we do stumble upon it, but just hearing from you ladies, hopefully offer more insight uh, to someone who's just, you know, maybe exploring right now and uh, it's not quite sure. And hopefully maybe you shifted them in that direction because we need more mental health experts. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. We don't have enough because I don't care how, um, how great of a job you do, you can't get to everybody. There's not enough time in the day. And so we need more uh, professionals in the field to um, really help everybody that can be helped and needs the help and wants it. Um, so with that, before we go on, Chris, you know, yeah, stop it. Come on. Just to kind of encourage people about the importance of African Americans in psychology, mm -hmm. less than one percent of all psychologists are African American. Wow. So just imagine when your child is being tested or being diagnosed, or if you are being diagnosed, mm -hmm. the chances are that it may not be someone who looks like us. 
So, you know, I'm an advocate of our HBCUs, our, you know, our, our, um, our students of color considering psychologists because as you can see, mental health is becoming, you know, more receptive in, in our, um, in our group. So we need to really try to push, you know, for people to join the field who look like us, people of color, so that we can feel included in the field. So again, less than 1% of all psychologists are African American. And I, I can't tell you how many, and I know everyone else can tell you how many clients we have to turn away because our caseloads are so full, but they want African American therapists. And you know, we're limited on who we can refer to. So I just want to put that out there to encourage more people to join the field. I love that. It, I mean, it's a very good point. And I would have thought a small percentage, I wouldn't have gone for one, right? Um, so that was kind of mind blowing. I don't know if y'all saw my expression, but that was pretty mind blowing just to hear that it is 1% for, of that representation. Um, but that also means the opportunity is great. Right. Um, and there's, there's much, much room to grow and much, much room to uh, change that. So I love it. Thank you for sharing it. I love stats for the record. So thank you for uh, statistics. We got facts going around right here. These, these not opinions, okay? These are facts. Um, so all of my other questions, because you kind of started touching on stigmas a little bit, but before I get to stigmas, because stigmas exist because of barriers or because of thought process. And so I want to talk about barriers. What do you believe is the greatest barrier for female leaders to seek help with mental health that you've seen, that you've heard, that you've experienced, whatever it is, uh, what do you think that, that number one barrier is? Um, I would think, it's, it's specifically if I'm thinking about Black women, it's the strong Black woman schema. Mm. Um, a lot of us feel like we have to show up and be perfect. Like we got to be the world's best cook, best wife, best mother, entrepreneur, CEO, be Betty Crocker. Gotta, like we have so many roles and we don't really get those safe spaces to be vulnerable because then it's seen as weakness. And it's just kind of passed down from generation to generation. So it's really trying to say that it's okay for me to feel these feelings. It's okay for me to have feelings about lived experiences and creating those safe spaces for other Black women to do that. So I think when we play into the strong woman schema, of course, we know that mimics depression because depression in Black women looks different than it does in like their, in our white counterparts. So um, I think that really plays a barrier. And of course, we know about the healthcare disparities for our community. It's so hard to access proper healthcare, depending on like if you're in North Memphis, like I was a school social worker there for three years and it was so hard trying to find resources for them within the community. Like we oftentimes had to refer out of the community. So um, just really kind of finding, trying to close those barriers like telehealth. Now, a lot of people are using telehealth to close those barriers. Now you can get therapy from home you know um you can meet with any type of doctor or physician and get a diagnosis treatment uh, from your home now so just trying to close those um gaps i love it and you're right um when we talk about the strong woman syndrome you know uh women we we bear it a lot we bear a lot and we try to take all of it on so i love that thank you for sharing that very honest um opinion and, and fact shit excuse me um all right dr audrey um, for me, what I see a lot of is um, women lack awareness, really, of areas of uh, opportunity for them to grow. Um, sometimes we surround ourselves with people who aren't um, the most honest about um, what things that we can use to, to grow as leaders, as people in general. And so um, what I see is a lot of people just lack awareness of their limitations, um, the awareness of what they need to become a better person, a better leader, a better mom. Um, and sometimes that's a hard look in the mirror and everyone doesn't have the resources or the skills to be able to do that at that time. So, you know, it's always a delicate, you know, uh, back and forth game that we play as therapists trying to assess to see if anyone, if the person that we're seeing has the resources to, to handle some of the things that we see um, on the clinical end. But, I, but for the most part, it's, you know, a lot of people just don't have the awareness of, of the areas where, where they need to grow. Love it. Love it. What about you, Courtney? Um, I like those responses, but I'll add uh, I like probably lack of insight into um, what they need and what's actually beneficial for them. Because as leaders, leaders tend to put a level of expectation 
on themselves and to continue to burn out. And so leaders also, I think women leaders can normalize excessive work and you don't realize that that leads to burnout. So it's like a lack of insight for leaders can cause mental health issues. Um, I think that's relevant because I run into, well, I talk to a lot of women, they feel stuck because you get so used to doing things over and over and over and you normalize it. And then you feel weird when you do something against what mm. you made normal when it's not normal. So just the lack of insight. Can I just say you stepped on my toes a little bit right there? You stepped on my toes. Oh, just, all right. Just, but I need, I need them stepped on because that's what this is all about. You know, it's bold, transparent, and honest conversation, right? And so what I heard from them, like some of the top barriers I heard, I heard economics. Um, that was an obvious one. You know, we talk about healthcare and accessibility and resources. I heard outside influences. Uh, get those people out your ear. Get the people out your ear, you know, um, and being in tune with self. So it's that self-awareness piece that's important. And then I heard education. You know, and that's kind of what this platform, you know, hopefully addresses and, and hopefully economics, too, because this is a free opportunity, you know, to gain that education, to become more aware and have that self-reflection about need. So thank you all for that uh, and for those barriers that maybe we weren't really sure that we were even um, that it was even happening. Or maybe we don't realize that that's what we see in others that we could offer insight and maybe send them to Dr. Townsville and send them to Ms. Ford and Ms. Porter, you know. Um, so how is how important is it for female leaders to have a healthy mental life, uh, mental health? I know that's kind of a um, something we've already touched on, but I just want to dive in a little bit deeper. You know, how, how important is it for female leaders to um, be in tune with their mental health? Well, for me, I think it's the most important um, because to, to be a leader, you have to first be in tune with yourself so that you can get other people's buy-in into your vision, right? So um, that that's paramount for you to be able to know who you are, what your core values are, um, and, and be able to really communicate that to the people that you're leading. Um, it's always important, you know, especially for us, you know, our, you know, African American women leaders. We we have this thing that we have, and I can tell you, I was told this, you know, going to an HBCU, you, you have to be the best, you have to work harder than anyone else, and you have to stay late. I mean, all the extra we had to do, um, and even compared to African American men, we had to work harder than them because we were at the bottom of you know th this idea of climbing the corporate ladder i mean so that added pressure um is already innate in us that we have to do everything exceptionally well with no mistakes mm. but then think about when you put that pressure on yourself and you're a leader you're already adding that pressure onto the people that you lead, and that's not fair and and when you talk about people buying into your vision they have to trust you Mm -hmm. And that's not how you develop trust. And, and, and I can tell you that, you know, do mishaps in my leadership career, you know, I had to learn by bumping my head because there were, I didn't have a female mentor. I was mentored by all men and they were telling me masculine techniques, which didn't work for me. Um, and so I think for the most part, being in tune with who you are, in tune with who you are mentally so that you can show up for yourself and then show up for the people that you lead is really, really important. I love it. You know what really stuck out to me is like, we're talking about mental health for self, right? But you just took it a step further. Like our mental health absolutely impacts the way we lead, impacts how successful our team is. But what I really heard was like the transfer of emotions mm -hmm. or the transfer of thoughts and behaviors simply from how I woke up that morning, you know, that, that determines how my team is going to act for that day. Um, and that's a lot of pressure just at the initial thought, but it's also key to say, okay, what is my strategy now? How do I regroup? How do I reset, you know, when I do need to wake up on the right side of the bed um, so that everybody else in the, on my team, you know, work, works on the right side of the office today. <laughs> so, I know we all heard when your female boss comes in and they're upset, oh, she need a man. 
<laughs> we all have heard that, right? Stereotypes, but yes, I have heard them. I have heard them. Because we bring stuff from the outside into the workspace sometimes. And if we're, if we're not aware of how we need to disconnect or how we need to manage or, you know, stabilize what's going on with us personally, we're going to bring that into right, the workplace. Right, right. And, not, and not that the compartmentalization of it is bad. It's just like, get back to it later. Like, come back to it when it's most appropriate, when you really have the energy to focus Absolutely. and it's the right space to be in. So I like that. I like the that. The right space, it has to be the right space. Yeah. What about you, Courtney? Diavola? We'll go Diavola. <laughs> So when I think about why is it so important to make sure you manage your mental health, um, I like to tell this analogy, like you could be in the best health, health, like eating right, doing all the right things, exercising three, five days a week. You get into a car accident, say you bump your head, and then the doctor pronounced you brain dead. What does that mean? Hmm. It means you're dead. So it doesn't like, that's how important your mind is. That if something were to happen, nothing else would function. So you have to make sure you're taking care of yourself. And as a leader, one thing I always say is that if the head is dead, the body will fall. So in leadership, if you're not taking care of yourself, how are you going to lead anyone? Like how? How? Houseway. You have to make sure that the same thing that you're teaching people, you are also living by example. Like as a therapist, I believe every great therapist has a therapist. There's no way I can go sit um, in my chair and tell you how that this is the best thing or this is how you can work through your issues if I'm not one working through my own. So I know I heard you guys say about compartmentalizing. I definitely believe that, but I think a lot of time women will sweep it under the rug or, you know, people in general just sweep it under the rug and that's not a dream. It. You need to make sure you take that time to address it for yourself, address your own things, because if you don't, it will pour out into your family, it will pour out into your work, like it will affect all of that. So I definitely believe that mental health, as much as social media tries to make it seem like it's a luxury, it's not a luxury, it's a survival, like you have to survive, so it's survival, take care of it. I'm, oh, I, you know what? <laughs> You hit on something I didn't even really, I didn't realize that I, I saw, but we see on social media that, oh, self-care and you know, love you know, getting your nails, go, go brunch. And it seems like it's just that easy, but it's not, you know, it's not like the five second breathing we did earlier. It's not just that, you know, it's, it's many streams of that five seconds and whatever that looks like attachments of that uh, constantly. So um, yeah, I like that. I like that. Thank you for that. What about you, Courtney? So just to be clear, you said, what's, why is it important for women to take care of their mental health? You want to have a healthy mental life, yeah, mental health life, yeah. Okay. Um, well, for me, I see it as women, we dictate the trajectory of how the world goes around. Because if we are not functioning in our fullest capacity, we are like the nurturers, we're the teachers of our generation, like if you have kids, kids come to the mom to teach them or to just expect certain things. So how we handle ourselves, people around us watch. So we tend to, I, I believe if we're not taking care of ourselves mentally, other people watch that and, and we say, well, because even in conversation we say, well, this is how my mom did it, or I saw her doing it, or this is how my sister did it. You don't really you don't hear people speaking so much about men like that because we just assume they are, they're emotionless anyway. But because women carry the emotions, how our mental health is impacted affects how we deal with things emotionally. And so if our emotions and our mental health isn't taken care of, then everything around us tends to be un unlevel and it creates a shift like an earthquake. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree. It's it's the balance. It's it's and if there is a such thing as balance, right? But it is that constant intentional effort. Uh and it is emotional, which can be hard. My dad's face, uh favorite word, rest in peace, daddy, was uh you can't solve an emotional problem with logic. Um mm -hmm. and it is so so true, but emotions is intentional and it's trying to really place yourself in that truth moment 
outside of the emotion, like what is the truth happening and how do I respond uh, for myself right then? So I love it. I love it. Thank you, ladies. All right. So the next question is, because we talked about what is mental health? What does it look like? You know, what can it feel like? Now I want you all to give like a technique. Okay. We're sitting on your couches. I'm assuming y'all got couches, maybe, or maybe we're talking about Zoom <laughs> cameras nowadays, uh, but I'm in your couch or the audience is in your couch, what is the one tip? What's one tip that they can start today to kind of work on their mental health when they get off this call tonight? What's one thing you suggest as a technique? Um, set boundaries. Set boundaries. I agree with you, Courtney, but what I'm seeing a lot of is people don't even know how to set boundaries. Hmm. That part. You know, hmm. I think um, one learning what they are first put with yeah. them, doing you know doing the work after this call is figuring out what that is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we got two steps you know what what are your um what's the word what are your values what what are the things core values, you, yeah. your core values and, and then how do you set your boundaries around it y'all got two steps tonight we're gonna get to get a step three i feel it coming come on Gavin. <laughs> okay so mine's probably not i mean it's still gonna be a step. Come on. Right. Okay. So I'm all about first like identification. So what I always like to do, even when I'm first starting to work with someone, is a lot of times people go to um go to therapy so they can have healthy relationships with people. Like in, in some form of fashion, it's gonna deal with relationship, whether it's your mama, the your daddy, your significant other. So a lot of times we don't have healthy relationships because we really put a lot of unrealistic expectations on not only ourselves and how we show up in relationships, but on other people. So what I would have someone do who wants to start doing something today, let's do some identification. Do three categories, and we're gonna call it unrealistic expectations. The first category, self, what are some unrealistic expectations you're setting for yourself? Because before you can fix anything with anyone else, you need to check with yourself first. So if you're saying I have to be perfect or I can't ever say no, or I have to be the backbone to my family all, all the time, these are unrealistic expectations you're setting for yourself. Next category, others. What unrealistic, unrealistic expectations you're setting for other people you're in relationship with, they, they can't never meet. Okay, because I'm not fan of them. I don't do that. Okay. And <laughs> that means I got to hold myself accountable. That means they doing something that's okay. I'm sorry. Right, right. <laughs> and then that third one, unrealistic expectations you feel other people set of you. Mm -hmm. And then once you kind of identify that, because then you're like, oh, yeah, these are unrealistic. Change them out for realistic expectations. What are realistic expectations you can set for yourself, the people you're in relationship with, and that you feel that others can set for you? And then that'll be like your little foundation. Yeah, we got a whole roadmap. Like, <laughs> I love when these things come together. Like, that is so paramount to why I have these sessions, y'all. My notebook and my steps. <laughs> it's, it's on and popping, okay? This was free, y'all, okay? You got you a nice strategy tonight that you get to walk away with. So thank you all for that. Um, so keep in mind of... Um, our time. This is a question I want to ask and, and give it however it comes. Mental health treatment and medicine can complement one another. Um, how do we break the stigma of medicine when it comes to medical health? Getting those prescriptions and being okay with taking the medicine uh, and exploring what it does, even if it means I got to switch because maybe that dosage didn't, didn't work or that wasn't the manufacturer that, that worked for me, whatever. How do we break that stigma or would you even say it's slowly being broken? Um, I think it is. I think it's slowly being broken um, because I'm seeing a lot of people request, um, you know, referrals to psychiatrists, understanding that me, that me as a psychologist, I can't prescribe medication in Tennessee. Um, but again, I think that it is a personal choice. Um, I tell all my clients, I'm, I'm not going to force, you know, medication one way or the other. That's a personal choice. Um, but if they ask me, um, I describe, you know, a mental illness is, you know, similar to any other illness. Um, we don't get half the pushback for um, taking medication for a physical illness. Um, I don't see people telling their doctors who, um, that they're not going to take the medication to lower their blood pressure. Um, and so if there's a medication that can help you think clearer, that can help maintain or manage your mood or your anxiety, why not? You know, um, but again, it's a personal choice. 
And I don't feel that we need to take that choice away from other people. However, there are some mental disorders where medication is necessary. Um, you know, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that for any of my clients or try to, you know, say, well, you know, if you want to, it's okay. If you don't, it's okay. No, if you are, you know, having hallucinations, if you are having a manic episode, those are things that can only be, you know, addressed through medication. Um, however, medication doesn't have to be a lifelong um, a process. You can get to a point where you just need medication temporarily until you work with your therapist and then you learn the skills to be able to manage it yourself. You know, I tell a lot of my clients, maybe medication is what's needed just to get you over the hump. And then you may not need it anywhere. You work with your psychiatrist to taper you off and then you're okay. So I think that educating our, our clients about and educating people about, you know, the medication is not, you know, a permanent solution if, if you don't want it to be. But sometimes it's, it's a helpful aid that, that can help you kind of um, get the best out of therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Like you hit it on the head. I wanted to hear all of that. I wanted our audience to hear all of that. Um, and I like that you pointed out it's not permanent. You know, it can be temporary. There are instances where it is temporary and you just, you know, you need this medicine until we can get you back healthy and, and that's okay. Yeah. But, but you all, go ahead. Right, but, but you also need to think about your lifestyle choices too. Mm-hmm. Like, especially when you're talking about depression and anxiety, you can't take medication when you're still smoking weed and drinking. Like, mm-hmm. like we have to look at our lifestyle changes and, 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 and food choices. Right. Because there are some foods that can alter um, how we feel and in, in our thought process, you know, a lot of caffeine. So when we're talking about a lot of mental disorders, medications, you have to take all of that into consideration. Right. And going back to the example you use, it's no different than, you know, even though I'm taking my blood pressure medicine, I still need to exercise. I still need to be eating my green vegetables. It doesn't rid those like those healthy lifestyle choices that I need to make. So I think that was a perfect, perfect add on to that. Yeah. Courtney, the Avalon, did y'all want to add anything? I totally agree with um, Dr. Audrey, um, especially with the fact that it's a personal choice and it's not the end all be all mm-hmm. and educating the clients. Um, that medication does not fix you or your problem is the choices that you make that do because it's I mean she pretty much hit all hit all of the elements like it's such a what complements it is what you do physically how you eat Mm -hmm. spirit spirituality all of those factors play a part and I think when people aren't educated on the fact of you know, when you use a situation like, well, did so-and-so take their Ritalin today? Then you associate that with, oh, so Ritalin is supposed to fix such and such, you know, this particular behavior. When maybe it's the environment that the kid is in as well. Maybe it's the dairy. Maybe his body is allergic to certain foods that may trigger certain mood and behavior issues. So it really is understanding and being educated and knowledgeable on Yes, there are benefits of medication, but there are also side effects. And you have to know how it works with your body right. at right. that time. I love it. I love it. Do you have you want anything? No, I think you they know? said everything when it came to that. Yeah. That, that was a good one. I had this conversation often, right? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> God. You be my regular skill. I love it. I love it. That was, that was a really good one because I know... Um, I think, you know, as a community, when we talk about Black men, we got used to like, yeah, I'm gonna go sit on the couch and I'm gonna talk, you know, I don't have a problem expressing my feelings, but when it goes that step further, I think there, there are some continued conversations that need to have, uh, to be had, I'm sorry, so that people can embrace when those options are presented um, and when, when they're necessary. And it's okay to get second opinions and, you know, all of those things. But at the end of the day, after the exploration, you know, if it's this may be what's best, then let's consider it. So thank you for adding to that. Um, we're getting close to time. So let's do something a little fun. I always like to throw something that has nothing to do with anything, right? <laughs> so nothing to do with anything. I'm going to call this one this or that. I want to play a quick round, couple rounds of this or that. And it's, uh, I'm going to say two things and you pick which is your preference. Okay. All right. So cat or dog? Dog. 
dog. Mm-hmm. Sorry. <laughs> I heard. I heard. Dog. Not dog. Dog. Which mm-hmm. neither. <laughs> Somebody who I'm not playing, okay. Or PD, none of the above. That was not an option. But we go wrong. <laughs> we go wrong with it. How about fish or chicken? Fish. Chicken. Chicken. Okay. I'm a fish. I, I have to go with the fish. Awesome. Awesome. Naomi or Iman? Naomi. Iman. Hard when I know Courtney. Mm-hmm. I'll go with Iman. Okay, okay. They're both glamorous. I love both of yeah. them. Yes. Um, gospel or hip hop? Hip hop. Gospel. Gospel. Uh, I take a blend of both. You give me some gospel rap, gospel hip hop. Yes, some gospel hip hop. <laughs> I like it all. I like it all. Um, short or long hair? This one personal for me. I've been doing a little different. <laughs> it's all me. I've been playing with it all. So long or short hair? It's um, hard because you know I like to switch it up. Right. <laughs> it's based on the season. I know. <laughs> All right, so we got we got uh all what is it um none of the above I did um, but yeah and I know the yeah, you about to start your journey so yeah I know we're gonna do the it long is, it's gonna be long I won't <laughs> cut my hair no awesome, awesome. <laughs> exercise or Netflix Netflix <laughs> I saw Dr Hard you said uh, exercise all right. What'd you say, Corey? Are you talking about the ideal answer or the real answer? Ah, your real answer. And Netflix. <laughs> In this season, I'm Netflix. If you would have asked me the season, I may have said exercise. <laughs> Netflix season right now. <laughs> All right, last one. Cook or order out? Order out. Cook. Order out. <laughs> so I just want to I'm going to order out too but I'm going to just say all the folks that were on Netflix that just want to sit at the house and watch we picked order out all those who are, <laughs> are cooking <laughs> so I love it I love it I love it so with that I just like to play that and kind of just you know get to get a chance to kind of know you as an individual outside the mental health so I think we got a little glimpse of who you are and what some of your interests are so thank you for that um, so the last question I always like to ask before we round out because we're like 10 minutes out What's just one thing, like when, when I asked you to come on, as the weeks went by, we were, you know, uh, getting closer, or even as we talked tonight, what's the one thing that you feel like you want to make sure people hear from your voice and walk away with and, um, and, and integrate it where they can? We'll start with you, Courtney. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one thing that I really wanted to stress is the importance of taking care of yourself. Self-care is important to me and important when I work with entrepreneurs as far as in the entrepreneurship field because a lot of times entrepreneurs are doing things independently and on their own. You do, while trying to establish a team, but a lot is on you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we get caught up in the grind mentality, like the hustle and flow like I'm always moving and moving and going Mm -hmm. but I'm encouraging people to really focus on acknowledging your acknowledging when it's important to implement self-care techniques self-care techniques such as when it's time to set appropriate boundaries as you understand them knowing who you are as an individual your identity because you can get lost in translation and what the world wants you to be or your parents and not know who you are and what makes you happy and know when it's time to rest. And so you can be refreshed and you can be creative because a rest of mind is a creative mind and entrepreneurs are constantly trying to create things. And so rest, knowing who you are, your identity and boundaries is what I would encourage for people. I love it. So the one word I took from it, I need to rest more. Yeah. <laughs> because we're always on the go we just go 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 and then we crash and burn and we think just because we crashed and burn now we're resting but we're not so right. uh, thank you for that reminder what about you uh Diablo? let's go with you so I think and I feel like we probably hear this a lot but it's not selfish to put yourself first we get into this habit of everything and everyone goes before ourselves but that's not really realistic so it's okay to say I'm gonna say no to you to say yes to myself 
And I know we heard the analogy that if you're on a plane, what they tell you, put your mask on first before you can help someone else. And I hold that true to my heart. You got to put your mask on first because you cannot pour from an empty cup. There's literally nothing coming out. But imagine if you take those moments, like Ms. Porter said, of self-care and deposit, deposit, deposit into yourself. You're going to fill up. And what happens with a cup when it fills all the way up? It overflows. So that means if you're filling yourself up, everything around you is going to catch your overflow, your creative side, your career, your family, your love life. Everything will catch the overflow because you are operating out of a filled place versus a depleted place. We want the overflow. The overflow. We want, we want the overflow. <laughs> I do. I love, it. I love it. I love it. Dr. Audrey, what about you? And so I, I think I want to um, share something for women leaders and then just women in general. So the first thing for women leaders is, is something that I say all the time is never feel like you have to compete with the boys. Mm. And, and that's because, like I said earlier, I was, I was mentored by a lot of men executives and I've been a healthcare executive for 10 years. Um, and the one thing that I wish that I had was a female executive to teach me how to maneuver in that space as a woman, because there are things that we have and we possess our talents and our skills that are unique just to us. And we can't, you know, accommodate the things that men do and feel like, you know, we can do it too. I'm sure we could, but it wouldn't, it, the delivery wouldn't be the same. Mm -hmm. So I think for the most part, as a female executive, honor yourself as a woman, embrace yourself as a woman in, in leadership and let that be your driver, empower that, be, let that be the force that allows you to connect with people that you're, that you're leading. Love it, love and the one thing for women is to, it's okay to have a life. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, just picking back on, on everything everyone else said is, you know, okay. self-care and all, but it's just you knowing it's okay to have fun. It's okay to live. It's okay, especially if you're a mom, your baby is going to be okay if you go out and have fun. It's just like they're going to be fine. They actually want you to go <laughs> and have fun because that makes you a better person just finding that balance mm -hmm. so that, you know, you can, you know, like I say, you have a light within you. You want to fuel that light. And you can't do that if you're not living and you're not having fun and you're not enjoying yourself and you're not open to new experience and, and love. So that would be that those things would be what I would want women to walk away from this talk today. I like that. You you stepped on my toe too. Cause I, I I'm like, oh I know. <laughs> <laughs> if I go out, I should be home staring at her in her face and watching her that conversation. Right? <laughs> we have, we have, but you are so right. You have to find what is that 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 you need that looks different from anything else you normally do for everybody else. So that is my takeaway. Again, Dr. Audrey, I'll take it again. Uh, but no, that's that's a very good good point. So thank you all. Before we get off the I know how to get in touch with you. I got the main line, but uh, I want my audience to know how can they follow you? How can they support your uh, your initiatives and things that you're doing? How, to, how can they reach out to you? You can find me on Instagram. Um, that's at A-S-K, D as in dog, E-A, V as in victory, I-L-A, S-A, D as in dog, E, so ask Diavola Shade. Um, we also have our journal that came out this year, the therapeutic journal, Toxic Relationships Edition. If you want to win in relationships and heal from some unhealthy relationships like the one with your parents or past breakups, then this is the journal for you. A lot of clinicians like to use it with their clients. I've gotten great feedback on it. It's we also got our original journal that came out three years ago, which is the 30 prompts to health and self-discovery. You can find that on the website, xdiablashade.com. I love it. Yes, come through products. That's what I'm talking about. I love the product. <laughs> Multiple streams. I hear it. I see it. I see it. Just insert that. <laughs> All right, Dr. Audrey, how do we get with you? Um, on social media and Instagram uh, at Calyx, C-A-L-Y-X, psychological. Um, you can, my website is calyxpsychologicalservices.com and you can call us at 901-413-8663. And for everyone who has tried to make an appointment with me in the past and there was a wait list, I do not have a wait list anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
have I have space for at least three to five new clients. And so I know I got three calls today. They may work out. So I may have two more spaces, but just call Monica. She will get you scheduled. I do free on 10 minute consultations just to make sure that we're a good fit and I can give you what it is that you need. So feel free to, to schedule a free consult as well. All right, three to five. You better get in that first and second slot. <laughs> no more wait list. I love it. How about you, Courtney? How can we catch up with you? Um, on Instagram, um, Courtney L. Porter, LCSW. Um, or you can go to my website. It's just CourtneyLPorter.com. And my the best <laughs> contact number is 901-273-7676. All right, y'all got the phone number, just so y'all know. Like, that's, that's VIP treatment, all, <laughs> all from the Great New Leadership Series. Y'all don't know what right. that is. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you all. I'm so glad you all left your information. Uh, tonight has been rewarding. I told the ladies on the front end, like, mental health is kind of a special space for me, right? And I gave you all the reasons why. And you all gave me more reasons tonight. So thank you for that. Audience members, I hope it has been a space well worth your time. You can go back to the stoves, turn off the pots, make sure the kids are in bed, go back to studying, whatever it is you were doing. But thank you for choosing to be here in this space tonight. Use their contact information. These are very approachable, relatable, and just smart ladies that you want to connect with. So please connect with them. And while you're at it, again, follow the Great Youth Leadership Series. We are on Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, at the Great Youth Leadership. Our website is www dot the great you leadership series dot com um thank you for showing up and engaging with us we will be back next month i usually do every other month but next month is the 12 month anniversary for women leaders walk the talk i can't believe i've been doing this for a year come next month and so I had to make sure I had a special session. So make sure you all stay tuned. I've already got my panel getting lined up. You all will not want to miss next month. If you definitely enjoy tonight, don't miss next month as well. So um, we've got some more fun stuff. So please connect with us. Until then, like and subscribe and let's leave.